welcome to our talk on climate change literature. I'm Jenny Asher, a teacher, an academic at the Australian Catholic University and a literature lover. I believe in the transformative power of literature, not just as a resource for teaching and learning vital literacy skills, though it is, literature has the potential to expand the reader's worldview, to let them experience things beyond their own contexts. Literature helps us to empathise and can change our perspectives. In the context of climate change, these are very important character traits. In this webinar, I'm going to introduce this category of literature before we hear from some authors of some wonderful examples of climate change literature, Bryn McDibble and Claire Saxby. Then I'll wrap up with some ideas about using climate change literature in the classroom. When I say climate change literature, I'm thinking about a wide range of books, but they share some key characteristics. Firstly, they are quality literature, rich texts that extend and challenge the thinking of the reader, or can be used by the teacher to extend and challenge their students. They have high quality written and visual texts, so they are engaging and even immersive. Climate change literature crosses genre boundaries. There may be examples of contemporary realism, such as Greta and the Giants or The Inheritance. Science fiction, such as Grimsden, Grimsden by Deborah Abella, or non-fiction, such as the number of Philip Bunting's quirky and witty takes on informative texts. This category, the non-fiction category, is an important help to make scientific facts accessible to teachers and children. As well as giving us a factual basis for our teaching about climate change, non-fiction books can help inspire wonder and awe about the natural world. Literary non-fiction, such as Exploring Soils, published by the CSIRO, Stories like Backyard Magic can help children to appreciate the wonderful world around them. And I think it's an important part of teaching children about climate change, positive books that inspire children to care about the world we live in. Climate change books can be allegorical or symbolic. They can be subtle, wordless books like The Boy and the Elephant or these books by Jenny Baker, like Circle, or One Careless Night. They might be prompts for teachers to start talking about their effects of humans on natural environments. These books can be read at a number of different levels by different readers at different times, and they're not didactic. Books that try to bash children over the head with a message aren't likely to be engaging or motivate children to keep reading and explore them and they won't bear multiple readings. Active, thinking, big-hearted, authentic protagonists such as Hannah in The Polar Bear in Sydney Harbour are characteristic of high quality climate change literature. Such characters give children agency. They can step into their character's shoes try out new ideas, rehearse problem solving through the actions of these characters. Climate change fiction can have multiple or unusual points of view, such as Iceberg by Claire Saxby. In the un with the unusual main character of the iceberg, the story challenges the reader to take on a new perspective. By personifying the seasons, the effects of climate change are demonstrated and made more evident to the reader and can connect to the reader's emotions in a way that facts alone can't. We want to be able to read books to students that have strong heroic characters, but it is important that we're making sure that children don't get, uh, have the sense that the, the sole responsibility of solving climate change is with them alone. We want stories that empower them with uh, small responses, things that they can take action on. And I think 
Just One B is a good example of a story that does that. Stories that incorporate traditional Indigenous cultural knowledge as ways to counteract the effects of climate change are an important contribution in this area. And we see that in Bren McDibbles, the dog runner. And Bren will talk more about that when we hear from her soon. Hello everyone, and thank you to Jenny for that brilliant introduction to the world of climate fiction. I'm Cassie from PETA, and I'm joined here by two writers who have made significant contributions to Australian climate fiction for children. Claire Saxby, the author of Iceberg, and Bren McDibble, the author of How to Be. Um, let's start with you, Claire. Can you tell us about your book, Iceberg, um, what it's about and who it's written for? Hello, Cassie. Yes, Iceberg is um, a story of an iceberg. You know, it, iceberg is a main character, um, but really as a viewpoint character, a non-speaking part, as it were. Um, and I wanted to explore the whole world of the Antarctic and look beyond the whites and the blues to the colour that comes there in summer. Um, it was a much bigger task than I originally expected it to be, and it nearly killed me. But um, I couldn't walk away from it. I kept coming back to it until eventually I sort of um, found a way through and the iceberg itself was part of um, helping me find a way through. Can you talk a little bit more about um, the iceberg who is the main character and why and how, and how this story for quite young readers is really centred around the iceberg? I wanted to um, I wanted to visit the Antarctic and I wanted to look at all the different seasons. And often when we look at the Antarctic, we only see ice and we only see cold and that's all. But it's not the same all year round. In, in fact, it's one of the most polarised, literally, um, environments in the world. In winter, it is dark and cold and pretty, pretty tough. But in summer, it turns into this most amazing vegetable soup, if you like, of um, different species and different interactions. And the most amazing creatures do these incredible explosions of life. Um, krill, hide underneath ice for two, up to 200 days and then explode in enormous numbers and are one of the key species of the Antarctic and really important, but they then feed on phytoplankton, on tiny, tiny little plants that are frozen in the ice and only emerge once the ice starts to melt and starts this um, feast, this feast bigger than you can even conceptualize, or I couldn't anyway. Um, and I wanted to try and find a way to sort of unpack that a little bit to show the diversity and the richness and the wonder that is exists in this world and how it's connected to everywhere else in the world and how it is affected by everything else that happens all around the globe through animal migrations and um um, sea currents and exploration and all of those elements. Um, but I wanted to do it in a way that was accessible for small, for young readers. Um, that's what I set out to do. And with the help of Jess and my hands, um, I think that's what we've done. Oh, I think that is absolutely um, brilliantly achieved in the book, which is something that's so lovely about it. And I want to come back to Iceberg, but first, um, Bren, can you tell us about How to Be and, and what it's about and who you wrote it for? Um, yeah, How to Be. Um, it's about a future time after a famine um, that's been caused by a lack of pollinators. So the pollinators have died off. And in this future, um, you know, society has realigned itself and there's a lot of um, poverty now. So some of the poor children go to live in orchards and they hand pollinate the flowers and they call these children's children bee. And there's one child who's living in an orchard called Peony. She absolutely loves the orchard 
And the hand pollinators called bees, that's kind of the glamour job of the orchard. And she really wants to be a bee. So how to be. Um, but her mother has different ideas. Her mother's still sort of uh, old thinking about um, a different kind of life um, and takes her way to the city to be a maid. And then she lives with a family with very different values. And in that family is a, a girl called Esmeralda who um, has agoraphobia, which is a hard word for me to say. And um, they form a pact, these two girls. One is going to um, help Peony get back to her orchard and the other Peony is going to help Esmeralda get over her fear of going outside. So they form a pact together um, and it's sort of aimed at kids from about 10 or maybe nine if they're advanced readers up to 13 I think. Um, it has a lot of um, it has a lot of climate type elements in it to think about and, and talk about. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it's also another brilliant book that we're really excited to be talking about. And I wonder if you could um, maybe talk a little bit about how you built this future and, and why you chose that setting. Uh, when you think about anything, anything goes wrong with our climate or our environment, it always affects the poor people first. Um, they're the ones who haven't been able to afford insurance. If there's a flood, they don't have insurance. Um, so I wanted to just show a society where the rich people were untouched and the poor people were really suffering and a lot, a lot of sort of middle class people had moved down to being poor. And, um, and a society that no longer trusts in pesticides and fertilizers and is trying to live more naturally and so then they're going to need the labor and labor is cheap if nobody has any jobs, if everybody's very poor, if no one has any housing. So the orchards have taken people out of the dangerous cities to the, to the orchards and in return for a little bit of food and a place to build a shack, these people um, get to work and have a life and a purpose and they're safe and can be with their families. Um, so that was kind of how how I am you know that was when my thinking was when I created this future world um but I wanted to show that um the children could still have everything that children today have like a sense of safety and family and love and friendships and stuff like that yeah which is um something that in our introduction um Jennifer Asher talked about the idea of um children in these in these books who are maybe not necessarily heroes who can save the climate but they yeah. are brave and forward thinking and still children and can maybe contribute meaningfully in 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 child-sized ways as yes. well yeah it's more realistic that way isn't it yeah yeah and it kind of brings i think those themes into the real world a little bit as well yeah, yeah. um and I would really love to hear um, from both of you. Maybe let's start with uh, Claire on why you wanted to write about climate change, why you wanted to write climate fiction. I wouldn't say that I wanted to write climate fiction. I didn't set out to write um, a climate story. I set out to, to write a story that would um, offer information about and knowledge about this most pristine amazing world that we have that's not so far from us um it was only really at the end that I sort of wanted to just look at, talk about how finely tuned this world is how how all of the you know the from the whales to the krill to the fight you know the phytoplankton just how finely balanced it is and how one degree half a degree doesn't sound like a lot of change in climate but how it can have effects um, that are far reaching very very small changes in temperature um, just change the whole ecosystem and I guess it's a bit like juggling you know I had this sense of all these balls in the in the air and if there if there's just this slight change, then that whole ecosystem will be affected in in different ways. For example, um, of the four species of penguins that live on the Antarctic continent, um, 
one is largely unaffected by this current the current changes two of the species are actually increasing but another one of them is decreasing and so we start messing with the balance and with consequences that we have no real concept of we can predict um, but at, at heart what I wanted to do was inspire awe and wonder and understanding. And I think if we can offer our children quality information and quality access to um, information and with the help of teachers and librarians, we can at least help them understand what this world is about and what we stand to lose if we don't um, start to do something about climate. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for sharing those insights as well. Um, it can see how much the research that you did through your book really informed the direction of it, which is fascinating. Um, Bren, how about you? Why did you want to write climate fiction? Um, I'd been uh, wanting to write about growing up on the land because being a farm kid, but I always like to write future stories. That's sort of where my head is at. And I've been trying to combine the two. And then in about 2016, I saw a really amazing Huffington Post article and it was called something like the startling effect of um, bee loss in rural China or something like that. And it just had all these beautiful, glorious photos of adults up in pear blossoms with wands up against the sky in sort of bright colours. And it was, it was so amazing. But I just saw that and I instantly knew you know, this is, this is something my character does in the future. She's a hand pollinator. And sort of um, insecticide use and bee loss and pollinator loss, that was kind of in the news. It was just sort of niggling away at Australia, but it was huge in the news in Europe and um, the UK. And when, actually when How to Bee landed in the UK, it just hit the ground running because our bees are actually quite healthy, or they were until just recently uh, <laughs> when the um, varroa mite landed in New South Wales. Um, so it wasn't such an issue here, but it was in the, in the world news a lot. And I thought this is something kids will have, might have heard and not been able to digest, something they want to see the effects of. Um, because that's how I was when I was a kid. I'd hear scary news and I'd be like, oh, what would the world be like if the nuclear bomb landed or something like that? So I wanted to sort of show a world, show the effects of what can happen further down the line. And I think, I think it's important to show that um, because kids are curious and they want to know these things. So, yeah, that, that was why I sort of got involved <laughs> in writing climate fiction. Yeah, absolutely. And it really raises this interesting question as well about, uh, obviously, there's a really important role that nonfiction plays in conveying information and uh, building out the world and explaining things to to young readers. But also yeah. there is a real role for for fiction and for stories to, to be involved in shaping people's understanding of who we are and wh what we're doing and how we got here and where we might go. And I would love to hear from both of you um, in, in creating this um, th these beautiful pieces of fiction um, and wanting to present it to these young audiences, what was it important to you that they could take away from the book? What was, what was it important to you that they would uh, discover along the way? Um, maybe we start with Bren? <laughs> um, well, first of all, I wanted um, kids to be able to talk about difficult issues, but in a safe fictional context. It's not fair for, the, for them to like get all the news at this age because the news is highly sensationalized. So it can be really overwhelming. Um, but in a safe fictional space to understand the issues and talk about the issues, because if we don't get a good understanding and if we don't talk about them, we're never going to be able to change anything. So it's no good avoiding it. Um, and also I wanted them to sort of think about uh, what's really important in life because p &E has she values families and friends and, and a sense of purpose and um, understanding nature those are kind of her values and she's also like um, confident and courageous and she's she's eked out a really good life that 
she enjoys um, in this new world. So I just wanted kids to think about what is important. What can I still have, even if I, even if I lose anything, everything. And, you know, also coming along with that is how, how fragile nature is, as, as Claire said, just uh, the Antarct Antarctic having that moment of abundance in a cold, dark winter. They have that summer of abundance. And if, the, if there's just a temperature, slight temperature difference that cuts through that abundance and how are those animals going to cope with the, the rough winter ahead? And it's all, it's all these delicate balances we kind of have to be aware of. And where um, Peony does a, a good explanation of how pesticides cut through the circle of life um, in a really simple childlike way. So it, it's those kind of balances that we need to be aware of. Absolutely. Um, Claire, how about how about you? What was it important for you to to convey to young audiences and have them sort of receive from from the book? I I never set out um, trying to prescribe what a reader will get from my work. Um, one of the interesting things for me, particularly writing picture books, is that um, it's you know it's so important. Uh, that the illustrator gets what I'm trying to do and then has freedom to tell their own story. And working with, well, having Jess work on this story, I try and stay as far out of it as the illustration process as I can. Um, what she gets from it and what she then puts into the illustrations um, is, is a really important first readership, if that makes sense. Um, and Jess did a lot of work about changing where the horizons are and changing the amount of light and things in showing um, how the iceberg is across winter and summer and all the other animals that are there in the ocean. I guess um, I really, my most, most, um, the thing I wanted most for readers to get is wonder and um, curiosity. I want readers to, to go, to be curious, not to answer all of their questions, but to give them enough information that they can't help themselves but find out more. And when you have ice language like cheeky growlers and old grandfather blues and pancakes and just ice words um, and without even thinking about some of the interrelationships of the animals, how I, you know, I, I just want readers to have the wonder and the curiosity to go and find out more. Um, and readers do that. Readers will take what you've planted without knowing which particular element they've planted and, and they run with it. And I love that they run in all sorts of directions that I could not possibly have imagined. I, I love I love the idea, and it really I think it comes through um, from from Bren as well from you the the wonder and curiosity and the idea of giving information to encourage finding out more information I think is such a lovely and powerful part of, of fiction, and um, I think that we're really lucky that the two of you um, have been creating the kind of fiction that does inspire more thought and more interaction and, and deep and rich readings. Um, so thank you both for your books. Um, oh, thank, you. thank you. <laughs> thank you for saying that. <laughs> of course. No, really, um, they are they are such valuable contributions to 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 um to the to the to any classroom library, to to any and any child's library, I think. So um, no, and thank you so much for your insights and for answering our questions. It's been really lovely to hear from your perspective what goes into these books, what what helps shape them, and and what we can maybe take from from them going forward as well. Um, what we'll now do is head back to Jenny Asher, who will be joined by Associate Professor Pauline Jones, and they will talk about ways that educators and students can explore these two books and books like them in the classroom. Now I'm joined by Pauline. Thanks, Jenny. Hello, I'm Pauline Jones. I'm president of PETA, and I'm also associate professor in language and education at the University of Wollongong. And Jenny and I have been talking about climate fiction for children. And 
you will have heard her talk about the broad range of literature that's available that deals with the issue of climate change. Climate fiction is slightly different. It's a well-known category of text in adult literature, but it's an emerging one in children's literature, sometimes called cli-fi for kids. And we are going to, in a little while, talk in some detail about those two books, Iceberg and How to Be. But first of all, I think it's worthwhile pointing out that in Australia, we have a cross-curriculum priority of sustainability and climate change is part of that. So students in primary schools will be learning about climate change through science and you can find quite a few resources, including our fantastic book from Julie Hayes and Rowan Parkin on our sustainability uh, webpage. But they'll also be learning about climate change in HASS and here our emphasis is on climate change in the subject of English, in particular, the literary texts that students are going to be studying. And I know, Jennifer, you have a particular point about the use of literature, in particular, the, the critical literacy aspect of English. Yes, thanks, Pauline. Uh, we know in our curriculum the importance of critical literacy and I think it's extra important when we're thinking about this topic of climate change to help children to think about the author and the illustrator's perspective, what message they're getting across, trying to convey to their audience, thinking about what's being normalised, what's being treated as um, the, what are the most powerful voices and who's being heard or who's not being heard. Um, the common ways we think about critical literacy, but that's very important in the context of this climate change literature. And these two books take quite a different approach to the issue, the broader issue of climate change. In Iceberg, the authors looking at what it means, what a warming planet means for a very fragile environment like Antarctica, and then in How to Be, the author takes us into a dystopian future and what are the consequences of a planet in terms of diminishing biodiversity. So one of the things that we would always say is when we're working with literature with young people is to first of all read the text with them or allow them to read the text so that some discussion about the general purpose, the author's purpose and the meanings that they're uh, wanting to, um, I guess, convey to the reader. So we would start with questions such as, what does the author want you to think or believe as a result of reading this book? And that can lead to some very rich discussions about uh, the text. But Jennifer, you also have written a, a unit of work for us um, on Iceberg, and you've got some very good resources for teachers there, including activities for close reading of that text? Mm. Well, I think two very important tools for teachers when they're thinking about teaching critical literacy is the, the, um, the use of language and the use of visual techniques. So um, I'm encouraging through that unit of work on Iceberg classes to think really, look really closely at the, um, the illustrations and to see how the different angles that um, the illustrator has used in the way that they're positioning the, the reader. There's some that we're sitting on the ice shelf along with the, uh, the animals that are native to that area. And then there's other angles where we're taken right up at like a bird's eye view or a drone view looking down on the watery environment and then we're plunged down underwater. And I think that's a really, um, interesting technique that the illustrations have used and it matches really well one of those lines that's repeated throughout the book in the written text. Oh yes, that's right. That's that one. Um, if this world looks empty, look closer. So that keeps mm -hmm. coming up, doesn't yes, it? And that's, that's right. right. Yeah, 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 that's the enduring, the thread through the book, look closer. 
Iceberg is definitely a book that's been written to be read aloud. It, there's lots of beautiful sounds of our language there. We've got little bits of repetition, uh, li lovely alliteration. Uh, I particularly like the, the section that says summer sun softens edges. There's lots of rich noun groups and some very well chosen vocabulary. Winter bound, ice bound, sea bound, stuck. That's the, the use of the sentences and that one word in the sentence even reinforces that message mm. that, that Claire Saxby is conveying there. And of course, the language and the visuals uh, that convey the meanings in Iceberg are very different to the types of scientific texts that we would also use to uh, teach about climate change in, a, in subjects other than English, potentially. Right. Yeah, and I think the, the images in Iceberg immerse the children in that environment that looks like torn tissue, layers of torn tissue that, that very um, makes it almost translucent. Mm, it's beautiful, isn't it? And mm. all the jeweled colours and all of the, um, the, the techniques that um, Jess Rackleff has used, that'd be a great uh, springboard for children to have a go at using these techniques themselves, mm. experimenting with the different blues and how you might achieve those um, mm. to, to convey those similar sorts of uh, watery, cold uh, sensations mm. and experimenting maybe with um, some wax crayons and things like that mm. to sort of try and achieve the similar effects. Mm. Oh, there's, I, there's one, the opening lines of Iceberg are just beautiful and I'll read them. In the final freeze of an Antarctic winter, green tails wave across a star filled sky as if to farewell endless nights. It's just beautiful. It's and so of course crazy. the image is just the southern aurora across the sky. So I think to myself, what a wonderful apprenticeship into metaphor really. Um, that is so important in subject English. What a wonderful beginning of children's study of literary text that is. Mm. And we have the um, Bren's books, which are for the older readers. Mm, that's right. And you can imagine children moving from a study of interdependence and by, into uh, this book, it does rely on, I think, children understanding the importance of bees in um, the natural world and the work that they do in terms of um, pollinating plants. In this book, what the author gives us is a glimpse of a, a dystopian society. Something's happened, something's gone badly awry and bees have died out. And so there's a food crisis, there's extraordinary inequality between the rich and the poor, and also there's a rural-urban divide. And in this world, children are employed, strong, agile children to be bees, to pollinate the flowers for, po pollinate the plants for food production. And there's almost something Steinbeckian about those, that country world. It's, it's gentle, it's hard though, but people are surviving in comparison to the city world where things are very hard and people are reliant on the country world. So it's interesting. One of the things that um, fascinates me is that most of the characters are named after flowers. So we have mm. Peony, we have Magnolia, and I've been thinking about that. It would be an interesting question to ask the author. I wondered if it is partly a cataloguing of what we'll lose if um, we don't um, look after the environment. Mm. It's almost old fashioned. It is, isn't it? And it makes me think about that, um, the nature of names and that our identity is linked to our names and that link to um, between bees and flowers, that's it's part of that who that who each of those objects are almost, mm, isn't mm, it? Mm. Um, Bryn writes some very strong characters. 
doesn't she? She does, yes, yeah. Mm. What do you think the, um, the way that teachers could look closely at the characterisation, how might that help children to uh, vicariously problem solve? That's true, that's true, because one of the issues about using Cli-Fi with children is there's a concern that we're putting too much on children's shoulders, that we're causing anxiety. But in fact, what this book does, I think, is offer hope. Mm -hmm. It offers um, strong role models for our children, but also there's hope. And I think in that, there's some comfort for children. But with both books, what we have are very considerate writers. Um, they're considerate of the need for that hope and comfort among young people. And in the hands of the books with teachers, um, they're absolutely critical to understanding ways forward in this very existential crisis that we're in. Mm. So that makes me think that um, How To Be and um, Bren's other books, um, they'd lead themselves to lots of opportunities for drama mm. with students to, mm. to sort of uh, physicalise or embody the, the characterisation to further support their um, alleviation of their anxieties even as they are so rehearsing and practicing the, the sorts of skills that they'll need when they're they're older children and or older people mm -hmm. and um, taking on their role mm -hmm. in um, in our society and helping to combat that's um, right climate that's change. Really there's one more thing I think about um, that book and you, you I know you know Bryn's work well is that her respect for Indigenous knowledge is old ways of doing, and that comes out in this book. We can look back in order to go forward, that there are ways of doing and ways of nurturing the environment that have been around for a long, long time. Yes, that's and right. very important. Yes, mm. we're very privileged in Australia, aren't we, mm. to have that, um, that resource of Indigenous knowledge. And um, uh, I dare say that is one of the keys to our way forward, is mm. to tap into that Indigenous cultural knowledge for caring for country. And I think uh, books like The Dog Runner mm. um, would be a really great way to sort of start to link in even with um, local Indigenous communities and learn about native grasses and seed banks and, and that type of thing. So it's, like, it's definitely very hopeful. It is. teaches yeah. lots of opportunities for positive outward action for mm. children. I agree. Mm.